right? I'd have you do one screening to the U.S. Congress. What would you hope they would take away from this? I think more than anything coming out of making the film and as, as it starts to go out to the world, um, I realize that, that we talked about this earlier, our relationship with the fear of nuclear weapons ebbs and flows with the geopolitical situation. Right. And it shouldn't because the threat is constant. And, and very often when you look back at history, some of the closest moments to nuclear disaster have actually been in times of relative calm geopolitically. So even though the situation in Ukraine kind of puts it more in people, the forefront mm -hmm. of people's minds, the truth is nuclear weapons are an extraordinarily dangerous thing to have lying around the house. And it is not something we should ever forget about. And it's not something we should take lightly. And one of the things that frightens me the most about, mm -hmm. you know, you talk about coming home from work with anxiety, but when, when I hear in the media people, reasonable people talking about tactical nuclear weapons, right. as if this distinction can be made and can be made via first politi politicians and media sort of warming us up to the idea that perhaps there's a, a certain size of nuclear weapon that would be acceptable as opposed to the large ones. It's kind of the, like horrifying. the word clean coal. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's very mean, much clean coal, very tactical much. nukes. I don't think they exist. Well, and, and yeah. part of the but part of the fascination about Oppenheimer's is you dig in on the story. One of the things he did, you know, you talk about things I had to leave out of the film that are in Kai's book and mm -hmm. everything. One of the things that he did, he he was not naive. He did not get crushed by the system out of naivety. He was incredibly sophisticated, and he started talking about tactical weapons, bring the battle back to the battlefield because he wanted to play the army off against the Air Force, essentially. He mm -hmm. wanted to temper the threat of these giant genocidal H-bombs that the Air right. Force wanted to have in the air 24-7. But, you know, his he kept, you had it, I think he reiterated a few times in the movie, and it's held true, where his belief was, well, if we use it once, it'll mean they won't use it again. So far, that's been true. So it's interesting if you, yeah. there's a, a book um, by Hariri, one of the, um, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he talks about is if you look at all of recorded and only partially recorded human history, for most of that period of time, 15% of the population died from violence, from armed conflict. Mm -hmm. Since 1945, it's been single-digit percentages. So Oppenheimer's and Bohr's dream that war would end did not come to pass, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but as, as horrific as mm -hmm. the concept of mutual assured destruction is, yeah. it has acted as a restraint. And if you ask, so far, but so far, right. so fingers far. crossed. But if you ask what role is nuclear deterrence playing right now in the Ukraine, it is containing the conflict. Now it's scary because we don't know whether or not it's going to hold. But then again, you know what? Also, nuclear deterrence has done. It's deterred how much we help. It exactly. has deterred our ability to help Ukraine more. Ab absolutely. And there's been, but you know, why no fly zone? Because you've got to enforce it. But I would right. say we have seen what happens when wars spread across borders in Europe. Right. We saw it in 1939. We saw it in 1914. So, you know, one of my predecessors, um, uh, I think it was Norris Bradbury, said the role of nuclear weapons is to force world leaders to think of other solutions to their problems. Let me, one more screening I want you to have, which is in Silicon Valley. And what do you want those guys to take away from this film? I, I think what I would want them to take away is the concept of accountability. Um, not to, to sideline the conversation to the labor disputes going on in Hollywood right now, but yeah. a lot of it, when they're talking about things like AI, when we, we talk about these issues, they're all ultimately boiled down to the same thing, which is when you innovate with technology, you have to maintain accountability. And the rise of companies over the last 15 years who bandy about the word words like algorithm, mm -hmm. not knowing what they mean in any kind of meaningful mathematical <laughs> sense. These guys all know what an algorithm is, what it does. Right. People in my business talking about it, they just don't want to take responsibility for whatever that algorithm does. Yeah. And applied to AI, that's a terrifying possibility. Terrifying. Not least because as AI systems go into the defense infrastructure, ultimately they'll be in charge of nuclear weapons. And if we allow people to say that that's a separate entity from the person who's mm -hmm. wielding, programming, putting that AI into use, then we're doomed. It has to be about accountability. We have to hold people accountable for 
what they do with the tools that they have. Speaking of this stuff, you didn't use any CGI. Did Con- not use it. That's a decision. much lighter uh, yeah. question to answer. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a nice. Well, I say of, that, but, but no, no, you no, didn't I, because no, you know. And I and I wonder, are you going to pledge to not use CGI going forward? You don't want to be involved in generative AI. I mean, are there certain things you won't do? No, not at all. Yeah. Um, and I think that AI is already a very powerful tool in in our business as far as visual effect, visual effects go. Mm-hmm. Um, the the interesting thing, as you as you say, is computer graphics. To me, they're a touch anodyne. They're very versatile, but they tend to lack threat. Uh, of course, now they're seeming threatening in other ways. But, <laughs> but as far as your actual use of them, and, and as a filmmaker, you're trying to gauge you know, what colors are in your paint box, what techniques are you going to use, what's mm-hmm. the feeling. And so in an earlier film, at the end of, of one of my films, there's a nuclear explosion and Dark Knight Rises. It's meant to feel like it's far away enough that it's not going to affect mm. you and, and, and whatever. And so it's, you're actually meant to have a, a sense of, okay, we got away with it at the end. We did that with CG. It was beautifully rendered. My team, you know, incredible yeah. research. But coming to portray the Trinity test, and obviously we're here, you know, leading up to the anniversary of the Trinity test tomorrow, but it was it was like, okay, this this has to feel dangerous. This has to feel beautiful and terrifying in equal measure. Yeah. And real world imagery, real world things, I think they, they have that that bite. Well, I think beautiful and terrified. It's a pretty good, uh, we should put it on a movie poster. Because it was beautiful and it was terrifying. Congratulations. Thank you. I think we, we mean that as a compliment. <laughs> Thank you very much. And what a panel. Thank you, guys.